Sorry. It's not that often you find a gong behind you somewhere, right? Like, how often does that happen? So you sort of have to take advantage of it. Usually the sound I make when I start a presentation is a little bit more like this. That's a sound of the future, in case you guys aren't familiar. You may think the synthesizer is the sound of the future, but that was the sound of the future in the 60s. So today that's what the future sounds like. And uh, what the future looks like these days is it looks pretty small. Ooh, foreshadowing. But when you start talking about small things like mobile, um, I actually think these things have a really, really big impact, which is what I want to dive into today and kind of talk about some of the ways we can manage what's going on with mobile, look towards making great experiences for mobile devices, but at the same time, instead of using these things as, um, as they exist today, really look towards what's possible going forward through some of these experiences. So I mentioned mobile is sort of a small thing, but to kick off, I want to talk about a very big thing, which is this idea of mass media. So what's the mass media? It's any technology you can use to communicate with lots and lots of people, right? And uh, you guys should be familiar with these sorts of things. The first form of mass media to hit our planet was print. There's a bunch of printed pieces around you, there's some on the walls, right? There's posters in here, there's books, magazines. This was the first way that our planet was able to take a message and get it to many, many people um, across the world. And print was around for a long, long time. In fact, it wasn't until, remember that was like around 1500, it wasn't around until 1890 that the next form of mass media came out, which is recordings. So, laser discs, you guys probably have a laser disc, right? Mini discs? No, one mini disc player? DAT tapes? Wow, I'm dating myself. <laughs> After recordings, cinema. Right, so we went to being able to share audio, to so now we can actually share moving pictures. Ten years after that, radio, now we can actually broadcast those audio signals. So after this couple hundred year period of all we had was print, all we had was print, every ten years or so something new is coming out and really changing things. And you know, we think we live in exciting times now with the internet and with self-driving cars and you know, laser planes that create 3D models of buildings. Imagine if you were alive here and all of a sudden recordings came out. And all of a sudden cinema came out, and then radio, like audio moving through the air. I don't know what the equivalent of the 1800s, your brain popped or whatever. What is it? Blew my mind? I don't know what they said back then, but they, <laughs> they probably thought it a lot. Radio stuck around a long time, because that was around 1910. That was about 40, maybe 45 years until the next form of mass media came out, which is television. And television also had a decent run, because it was around 1990 or so that the internet really came out and became the sixth form of mass media to hit our planet. And nobody will really argue that the internet is a form of mass media, right? A means to communicate with lots and lots of people. But there's a theory that came out from an ex-Nokia executive called Tomi Ahonen, and he said mobile is the seventh form of mass media to hit our planet. And to me, this has really profound implications, because when we start to think about doing things like designing for mobile, designing for the small screen, this is sort of the association we have, right? How do we take our internet-y things, our software-y things, and fit them onto these smaller devices, if you will, these portable devices? Now that's one way we could look at the issue, but if we look at it at the scale of a transition from something like radio to TV, or a transition like something from TV to the internet, I think it's fundamentally a much, much bigger deal, right? And has a lot more implications. As a result, it's worth looking at, is mobile really the seventh form of mass media or is Tomy smoking Nokia crack, which there's very precious little of left these days if you guys follow the stock price, right? So to understand if something is really in the next form of mass media, is it really that big and important, let's look at something small like babies. This is how many babies come out every day on the planet. So we've figured out that algorithm. I think it was a Google project that figured out that algorithm? Uh, unfortunately, this is how many iPhones come out per day. And I blame you guys for this one, but this is how many Android devices are activated per day. Add in the total number of iPod touches and iPads, add in the dwindling number of Nokias and the uber dwindling number of Blackberry devices. I feel so bad. I feel like I still have to include them. 
right? But every time you look at one of these charts, they're just getting squeezed by iOS and Android. So let's do the maths. How many is that? It's like 3 million plus mobile devices entering the planet per day. When I started doing this sort of bit around kids versus devices, a year ago, I sort of put together a little blog post comparing how many kids are born per day to the amount of mobile devices entering the planet. It was about a million. Over the course of the year, that number has gone up by another two million. So now it's an order of magnitude difference, right? 300,000 children entering the planet per day compared to three million devices entering the planet per day. And those, because there's so many of these things coming out, the rate at which they're spreading is tremendous. The way that they hit mass market penetration, if you will, right? How long it takes for 40% of the US audience to have one. Telephone took about 40 years. Electricity in the computer, which you think everybody would want electricity as soon as possible, took about 15 years. Radio, mobile phone, internet, again, some of these really transformative things took about five years. But the fastest growing technology ever to hit mass market penetration in the United States has been the smartphone. Took roughly three and a half years. Right. right now, it's at 58% of the addressable audience in the United States has a smartphone, and it continues to grow. It'll probably continue to grow until you hit saturation, right, where every feature phone turns into a smartphone. And that's not a lot of time to figure out what to do with mobile, right? Three and a half years is not the kind of opportunity the telephone companies had, or the telegraph companies had to figure out the telephone. They had 40 years. And the impact of this is, if you look at what used to happen in the personal computing market. This is what personal computing market share looked like in the first 15 years. Anybody remember the TRS-80? It had a tape deck. So you guys remember TRS-80, but you don't remember mini disks. Come on. <laughs> talking to geeks here. Eight track, anybody remember an eight track? Okay, thank you. Jeez. Commodore, Amiga, Atari, right? Typical for a new technology. A couple companies trying to figure out what is it? What's the personal computer gonna be? Um, to use the language of today, WTFPC is what I think we can call this first 15 years. The next 15 years is basically all Microsoft and Intel kind of taking over the personal computing market. But the past three to four years is where it really starts to get interesting. And here's the Androids, here's the Apples just ripping into the personal computing space. Right? Because what people are doing on mobile devices is what they're used to be doing on their laptops, their desktops, their PCs. Uh, when they got home, right, or when they were at the office. And so, big, mobile's big, that fits part of our definition. The next piece is, can you communicate to it, right? In order to be a form of mass media, you have to be able to broadcast out to it. And right now there's six billion connections, there's gonna be 10 billion connections. I suspect this will happen faster. Pretty much every outlandish prediction they make about mobile tends to come true a year or two earlier than they thought. And in this case, they is Cisco, who's seeing like a 26x worldwide traffic growth in mobile right now. So they're saying in about two years, we'll have 10 billion connections. I think that'll happen sooner, but we'll find out. So there's lots of these devices. You can broadcast to lots of people. And frankly, this is the stuff that I think gets the most interesting to me. The little device that we carry in our pockets can do everything all six forms of mass media that came before it can do. Can you? Browse the web, yes. Can you watch TV shows, yes. Can you listen to the radio, yes. Can you watch movies, yes. Can you listen to recordings, can you read your, right? So this little thing has essentially swallowed all six forms of mass media that came before it. Just like TV, or the internet can do what TV did, what radio did, what cinema did, so on and so forth. So that's another indicator that this is actually a new form of mass media. Plus it could do all this stuff that none of these other forms of mass media can do. Mobile is always with you, always on. It can be used immediately at the point of inspiration. It can be used sort of in a, if you want to use the term augmented reality context, you can, but you know, you're doing something in the real world, all of a sudden you're networked, you have your services and information and you can access them through this always on interaction. So not only can it do everything all these other forms of mass media could do, but it can do more, right? Yet another indicator that we actually are dealing with something very transformative, right? Something very different than just a smaller laptop, than just a smaller PC. Yet, whenever we make this transition, whenever we go from something like radio to TV, what do we do? We copy over all the things that we were doing before. 
sponsorships, the idea that somebody sponsors a program was a business model that was literally created for radio. They went and iterated a whole bunch of different ideas and they couldn't figure out how to make money off of radio and then they came upon the sponsorship idea, which is still on TV today if you've ever seen an ad in front of your Hulu Plus paid subscription channel that you're already paying for and they still give you ads on. So that's still around. Spokesmen are literally people who spoke for a product, right? Spokesmen. And uh, these are the old time radio shows that made their way over to TV. I don't know how candid camera worked. It was like candid microphone back then, right? But there it is. And when these things made the transition over to TV, this is what they looked like. What did they do? They pointed a camera at people reading radio shows. It took years before we realized the true magic of television and what it could actually do as a unique medium, right? So it wasn't immediately clear that the radio, the TV was not radio. Similarly, print was around for hundreds of hundreds of years and those things that we see around us all the time inside of print and we, you know, kind of consume on a daily basis are still stuck with us even when we go and design for the internet today. Many people will talk about how the web is not print, but yet we still have all these conversations about pages, about layouts, about typography, right? about graphical ads and things like this. Stuff that's really inherent from the print world. But the web is not print. And similarly, guess where I'm going with this? Mobile is not a desktop PC, right? But this is a very common transition, so common in fact that I think it's totally understandable why we're trying to adapt what we already know and try to fit it into this new thing. Because it's, it's get Scott Jensen, who some of you may know, used to work over here on some of the mobile things. Before that he was over at uh, the Newton team of all places. But um, he lays it out as it's very common for us to copy what we were doing before, gradually extend it, and then finally figure out something new. Right? It takes a while for us to figure out what sticks inside of something different because it's, it's, it's a natural process. As long as we're sort of cognizant of this natural process that we're going through, I think it's okay. It's when we aren't aware that what we're actually doing is importing our ideas from somewhere else and trying to fit them into something different that we run into issues. And this is the thing that I still struggle with very much on a personal basis. I oftentimes find myself putting something on and in a, into a mobile experience that is just stuck in my head from 20 plus years of the internet or 20 plus years of desktop software or GUI metaphors and things like this. And I put it in there and we you know, make it out and then we actually start using it and see what happens. They're like, ah, oh. right? Wasn't the right thing to do. So what does this process look like? Uh, I don't think I need to convince you guys that mobile is a big deal. You get it, right? But PayPal's numbers sort of illuminate the story. Yeah, okay, mobile payments, sure. Four billion last year, 14 billion, right? I mean, this is the kind of thingamahoo we're talking about. What do you call those? Hockey stick curve, right, in the venture world. So yeah, and the other interesting thing about this, remember I said every, uh, every time there's a number that comes out, it ends up becoming bigger. So PayPal was predicting they'd hit eight billion when they were in uh, the beginning of 2012. Then they said it's going to be 10 billion. Then they said it's going to be 12 billion. And they ended up with 14 billion over the course of 2012. And uh, other companies are finding the other really common thing you get is you hear people saying, oh, well, conversion's lower on mobile. Or people won't do X, Y, or Z on mobile. Oh, because this screen's too small. Oh, it's a different, you know, different kind of thing. And um, it's actually very common in the e-commerce world to talk about conversion being lower on mobile. But I think a lot of that has to do with them not really designing uniquely for the medium. Because when you do, you can actually have higher likelihood to buy. You can have higher likelihood to subscribe. You can actually end up with more engagement. Right? And it boils down to, are you actually thinking about it as a unique thing or are you porting over what you were doing before? And uh, other companies are going to sort of be forced to figure this out even if they don't take the time to invest. As you probably see, in, Actually, this just happened recently, to my knowledge, with one of the Google products, uh, which is Chrome, right? So now Chrome has seen mobile grow like crazy. So all of a sudden, Chrome for mobile becomes a much bigger deal than Chrome for the desktop. And I'm sure that's happening in other products as well. But 60% um, 
of Twitter users now on mobile, 70% of Pandora users now on mobile, other companies, huge mobile growth. And I think it's worth looking at this at a big level. So let's look at a very large website. No, not Google, but Facebook. And uh, this is the past two years of monthly active users on Facebook. Anybody notice anything wrong with this curve? P.S. by the way, they had an IPO right around here. It's flat. Who thinks Facebook is growing? Okay, like one guy. Actually, they actually are, but this is, this, this is what's happening right here. Right, so all of their non-mobile use is essentially flat for two years, and all of the growth is happening in mobile. And this, this moment where these two lines intersect, I think, is really, really interesting. So I've given it a name because I think it's so interesting, which is when your monthly active use or whatever key metric you're focusing on switches bits, when you cross this mobile line, all of a sudden everything sort of changes pretty fundamentally. And I'll talk about that in a second. The other really interesting line on Facebook's chart is this one, which is the mobile only audience. This is people who only access Facebook through mobile devices. And that has been kind of the fastest growing population on their end for quite a while. In fact, there's entire countries where a huge chunk of their audience is a mobile only audience. And what we're starting to see across the world is that many people's first time internet experience is through a mobile device. They're sort of bypassing the desktop laptop internet and coming online with a uh, mobile device in hand as the first time thing. And this quote from uh, Mark, I think, really summarizes it. That's, it's sort of the second part that intrigues me. We are now a mobile company. Because previously, Facebook always ran around and said they're a web company. And again, here we are at Google. Google is a web company. Was, maybe is shifting now. But like, think about the transformative nature of going from we are a web company to we are a mobile company. And talking with lots of companies around the valley, you hear this story over and over again right now. So I don't know if you guys saw the news from Zynga yesterday, where they essentially laid off 520 people and they're dead. They're now a mobile company. Kind of late to figure that out, right? God bless them. Let's hope they can do it. But they just hit this moment where they said, we are now a mobile company. It's the only thing that matters to us. But crap, we had to lay off half the company to figure that out. Um, and you know, there's other companies who shall remain nameless that are seeing the same sort of transition. And I think it's really hard to do, honestly. You know, I can tell you that in the, in the Facebook world, this was not an easy step. Because what happens organizationally, at least from my outside perspective now, thank God, um, from my outside perspective is people hear it, but they don't do it. Right? OK, mobile's really part. Uh-huh. No, we really got to do it. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. <laughs> and it's not until you know, something really dramatic happens that people really take a very, very large shift. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a big transition and it's a really big deal. So if we start to think about mobile at the scale of a new form of mass media, I think that gives it enormous weight. If we look at it as this transformative force that's changing some of the largest internet companies in the world to mobile companies, right? I mean, this is the scale we're talking about here. I don't think it, bless you, I don't think it makes sense to really think about this as a small screen anymore, right? I think it has to really fundamentally change the way you think about a lot of things. And that includes design, that includes development, that includes all kinds of stuff. And the other scary thing about that is you know, a lot of our instincts that we've honed and learned over the years are just flat out wrong. Right? They seem like it'll work, and we're like, oh, it's kind of the same thing, oh, I know all this stuff, and we put it in there and try to make it work, and we ultimately turn out to um, be wrong, especially the early stuff we were doing for mobile. So with that kind of in mind, what I want to do is take a look at what is some of the stuff we've been doing, right? What are the things that are sort of inherent in our mindsets and our approaches? How do we take that and adapt it and optimize it for this sort of mobile world today? And last but not least, what does that give us in terms of ways to look towards the future, right? Like what are ways that we can look forward? And uh, I propose the Luke W. Helmet instead of the Google Glass. It's actually a little bit more immersive, <laughs> right? And people won't look at you funny when you wear it. <laughs> so. What do we know? What have we been doing? How do we adapt and optimize it? And what does it tell us about the future? 
And um, I want to look at this transition in places that often get overlooked. Right? I have this fascination with things that I consider to be the linchpin of web experiences. Things that are enormously critical to like foundational elements on the internet, but often get ignored and bastardized and not thought of. Because people don't really think about them, because they're not interesting. Right? They're not like these super fascinating challenges. Instead, they're really boring, lame, and we think we've solved it. But there's huge opportunities there. So what kinds of things am I talking about? I think things that are critical to conversion funnels, things that are critical to the point where actually something happens that creates value for both your customers, your users, and your service. And one of those things that's enormously overlooked is this login thing. And you can say, Luke, what's wrong with a login? Right? Does anybody know what a login screen looks like? Yeah. It's two input fields, a checkbox that I swear does nothing. It's the thing like keep me logged in. It's totally put there as like a little decoy to mess with your head, right? Because you check it and it doesn't keep you logged in. And then it has a button. So it's like two input fields, a checkbox, and a button. What is there to talk about with this? Well, first of all, this is a very, very broken system. Lots of active authentications per day. I think something like 95% of US companies use username or email and password as an authentication mechanism for their service. So like everybody is doing this. And uh, that means we are logging in all the frickin' time. And some of us, probably no one who works at Google because you have to pass like 17 tests to get hired here. You guys have probably never forgotten a password, right? But other people do. Other people do. In fact, when I was at Yahoo, we didn't have tests to work there. That explains lots of things. <laughs> um, maybe Marissa added the test now. I don't know. <laughs> you definitely can't take the test at home. You have to take it in the office. <laughs> I know that part. No take home tests. So um, when I was at Yahoo, 15 to 10, 5 to 10 percent of people that went to try and sign in to Yahoo actually failed to log into the site. At this time, back then, you know, this was like seven, eight years ago during the days of laser disks and mini disks and eight tracks and TRS 80s. <laughs> back then, uh, Yahoo was 15 percent of internet time, right? It was the largest site out there. And five to 10 percent of the sessions for the largest site in the entire internet resulted in password errors. If you're doing anything with intranet services, this is the number one issue that people have. So I personally contend that login screens are fundamentally broken. And uh, you know, I was trying to scratch my head and understand why. Why do people have problems with these things? <laughs> you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's so clear. Everybody knows that the way you do usability is you write things out for people, right? You sort of like explain it in text. That's how you make things usable. So they've done that for this login screen. Um, and you, know, you have to use one letter, one number, one special character, but not these characters because they are not special enough. <laughs> if it's special, it can't be first or last. That's OK, right? Uh, you can't have what were called sets. So like, if two characters sit next to each other and they're the same, that's a set. And that is not good. You can't have that. Also, be aware that. Um, Characters in the first, second, and third positions cannot be identical. Neither can the second, third, or fourth positions be identical, nor the sixth, seventh, and eighth positions be identical. <laughs> and you can't use Texas Child or the months of the year, because that's the first thing hackers try. Have you seen these guys, right? So all the guys, you know, they're like hacking these things. The first thing they're like, Texas Child, and boom, they're in 80% of the time. <laughs> so do not do that. And if you ever make it through this, realize that the past eight times you solved this puzzle, you can't use that answer again. Right. Again, Google employees, no problem. But the rest of us, I could see how maybe we'd struggle with some of these <laughs> challenges. And so it's disheartening to me when I see people going from you know, the desktop, laptop side of the coin to making a mobile experience. And what do they do? OK, let's make sure the login screen fits on the smaller screen. This is what I mean by approaching this as a small screen problem. You see this over and over again with like every single design pattern that's out there. It's like, how do we make our login screen fit on the smaller screen? And all those problems that I just walked you through now are on a smaller screen. Congratulations, the mobile revolution is here. Right? But it's actually worse than that. So here's our friends over at eBay. And uh, they have taken the time to create a mobile web experience where you can go buy, browse, and shop on things. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, they're doing like 14 billion in PayPal, 14 billion in uh, global merchandising volume. 
on uh, mobile, so they're doing really well. But when they created their mobile web experience, they left something off the sign-in screen, which is this, I forgot my user ID or password. And even if you try to log in, it says, uh, uh, uh. no, guess again. So I observed this, and I went and talked to a very large e-commerce company that's doing really well in mobile, who shall remain nameless. And I pointed out to them, I said, you know, hey, you guys don't have, they're in the same situation. You don't have this get back my username and password thing. Are you seeing any issues with that? I would expect you'd see issues. Like, oh yeah, we actually get a lot of customer support volume for that. A lot. I'm like, oh, well, how much? So I will ask you, what percent of their customer service calls do you think were related to login issues? What percent? 50? 70. 90. 90. 90% 90. 90 of their customer service increase. This is the thing I'm talking about. Like, who thinks about the login screen? Nobody thinks about it. You know who thinks about it? Your poor customer service department that every single time you get on the phone, yes, okay, I understand you can't get your password. No, no, do you have a desktop computer? Yeah, okay, so get your desktop computer. Okay, no, no, take the Coke out of the holder. No, that's not a drink holder. That's a CD drive. Okay. So, uh, recently, eBay put in this, I forgot my user ID or password thing. And we can say, oh yeah, you know, eBay, weren't they made in like the 90s, right? It's this just like crufty old stuff. How can we expect them to figure things out? What about our Web 2.0? Was Web 2.0 a thing anymore? I don't think so, <laughs> right? It's like the eight track of the web world is Web 2.0. People make jokes about it. <clears throat> um, but LinkedIn used to be a Web 2.0 thing and they have this touch.linkedin.com experience, right? where you can go and access LinkedIn on uh, mobile devices. And again, they have a really nice feature here called Forgot Password, which when you try to log in to LinkedIn on the mobile device, eh, please try again. Now, let me ask you guys a question. When do you go to LinkedIn? What takes you to LinkedIn? Email. Email. <laughs> this guy needs a job. I got a couple things for you later. <laughs> Everybody else, hopefully, Happily employed, but does anybody go to LinkedIn when they get an email? Yes, is that the primary way to go to LinkedIn? Somebody sends you an email? Do you check your email on your phone? Yes? yes. One of you? Everybody else checks it on glass? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> so, this happens to me all the time. This is the only way I go to LinkedIn. So I get an email. It's like, Tim wants to connect with you, right? I'm like, all right, I love Tim, right? I want to connect the hell out of Tim. So <laughs> here I am. Me and Tim are going to connect. It's going to be awesome. So I click accept. Right. I have the app. <laughs> <laughs> I have the app. What do I do? This is a legitimate question. What do I do? I say no thanks and I lie and they set a cookie that says he doesn't have the app so next time I go to this link they bring up the thing, get the app. So this happens, right? And I say no thanks, so I lie. And then I get this spinning little thing because they actually are loading a dust.js template where they serve an empty body tag and manually or, and automatically inject through JavaScript the entire HTML page. So that's like a, yeah, I don't know, 30, 45 second process while the thing spins. And then I get the login screen. And I'm like, I have no freaking clue. So I try and try and try, and then this happens. <laughs> it's not that it's hard to read, it's that it doesn't even fit. I can't even solve it if I wanted to. Nobody looked at this on an Android device. Nobody went to actually see that you can't physically see the captcha that you're trying to dissolve in your mind. And so, you know, this is frustrating. Right? And I think it's especially frustrating when you think about what's the number one way to go to LinkedIn? Through an email. Where are we checking our email? On our phones. You'd think this would be an important critical flow to those guys. And I've been on their butts a while about this. Lovely people over there. Many of them I used to work with in the past. And uh, they added a little forgot password link, which is fantastic. All right, so what's the moral of some of these stories here? The moral of the story is what uh, Stephen Huber says in his little book, Mobile Interfaces. Mobile should not be a dumbed down, limited experience. Because what happens in a lot of these situations, people are like, oh, nobody's going to try to recover their password on mobile. It's too hard. 
oh, we'll just leave that feature out because why do they want it on this small screen, right? They're not thinking of it as a complete experience. They're not thinking of it part of this holistic thing. And so what they do is they just end up removing things that they think aren't important. And if it's critical on a 7-inch screen, if it's critical on a 15-inch screen, if it's critical on a 30-inch screen, it's probably critical on a 4-inch screen too. So that's one thing. Now to give LinkedIn some credit, you know, they've built this touch.linkedin.com experience and they've done some cool things. So small stuff like when they're collecting an email, they'll use type email which will give you this nice little keypad with a saving you some steps with an at and a dot. If you do fun things like turn auto cop capitalize and auto complete off which takes half a second in code, you will make people's lives awesome, right? Similarly for password. But password is actually a bigger problem. So password here, this is what happens with password. You're going to type in this password and you're looking down at this little keyboard, right? This little virtual keyboard and you type in the letter and then you look up right after you type it and it turns into a dot. And then you go down and you type it and it turns into a dot. And you go down and type it and it turns into a dot. And I, I think this is an issue because frankly, when you can't see what you're typing, it's really hard to know if it's right or not, right? And uh, many studies now have sort of shown this, that masking passwords, there's no data that supports masking passwords actually increases security. There's no study that says, hey, by putting the dots there, you've increased security by like 75%. But there are lots and lots of studies that say people fail to log in and that costs you money. 75% of the time when somebody fails to, uh, goes into a recover password flow in e-commerce, when they have a shopping cart full, they fail to buy. And as our friend Jacob Nielsen says, it's worse on mobile because <laughs> mobile is a magnifying lens for your usability problems. And by the way, you cannot do this to just any man. Look at how smooth his skin is. <laughs> it is just like perfect. Right? If somebody did this to me on a slot, I'd be like, oh, God, get it off of there. But this man is just, his complexion is as rich as his mind. <laughs> So mobile is a magnifying lens for your usability problems. If it's, a big, if it's a problem on a big screen where you're seated comfortably, you've got a precise mouse cursor, a full keyboard, right? You've got your, I don't know, whatever the hell else you have, 30 inch giant monitors, cables coming. If it's a problem there, it's going to be a much bigger problem when you've, all you've got is a little thumb and a tiny screen. Right? And this is what I mean, that mobile is a magnifying lens for your usability problems. Companies that have been doing mobile stuff for a while have figured out this login thing is a problem. So here's Facebook. If you try to log in on mobile on Facebook, they say, hey, that was wrong. We're going to show you your password in plain text. Don't worry. It's still secure. It's cool. Or we can send you a message. So if you send a message, they collect an email or phone, and then you get a link, and you just log in right then and there. Box.net has gone a little bit further, and they actually include a button that says show the password, so you can literally see what you're typing in there. Personally, I think they should flip the bit and make it hide password because of this idea of smart defaults. That is, the defaults that are set in place are the things people use most of the time anyway. And um, you know, the, ra the rationale for this is like, let's focus on creating a good experience here rather than this arbitrary pseudo-security. And why I say it's pseudo-security, if there is a man with a mysterious you know, handlebar mustache, right, trench coat behind me as I'm logging into my phone, you know what I can do? It works. You know the other thing? There's a virtual keyboard right there that I'm typing into that makes the letters big when I tap on them. Right? So if somebody has a camera pointed at my phone, this is the scenario you hear all the time. Oh, if someone has a camera pointed at your phone, they can get your password. Yeah, well, they can see you typing on the keyboard and get the same thing, right? So this literally is doing nothing to a certain extent. You know, you can argue whatever. But I personally believe, like, this is an opportunity to create a better experience. Again, because mobile's different, right? It's not like a PC that's sitting in front of your desk. It's something that's in your hand. You can move it around. You can put it wherever you want. You can pivot your body, what have you. So it has different things. So we have, uh, my current startup has a little product called Polar. And um, what we did when we created our login screen is we did, you know, I sort of put my money where my mouth is. And what we have is by default, your password is visible. You can always hit hide if you feel compromised and you want to get rid of it. And so we launched this. I wrote a little article about it. And frankly, I was really, really nervous because I thought I was going to get skewered. I expected people to be like, you know, Luke, you going to show a password? Just dummy, right? Don't you know the dots? Don't you know about the dots, you dummy, right? It's totally what I thought was going to happen. And I was really surprised 
that a lot of people started like coming out of the, the uh, what do you want to call it, so the web security closet, if you will, right? And started saying, hey, we did this. And we didn't have any negative security implications, right? We rolled it out for a large client. Steven, who I referenced earlier, 20 million users for Sprint, removed masking and uh, duplication of password, no issues, tested, well measured. And then I had my mind blown because it turns out somehow Yahoo did this. Maybe while I was there, I have no idea. But at, at Yahoo, eliminated the second password field, displayed full password upon form submission, and not only was there no security issues, but they actually had very significant improvements to the overall flow. Right? There's other things going on there, but double digit improvements is not a small thing. And to go back to our friends over at LinkedIn, they just launched a new mobile app right here. And what you'll note is you can go in here and see the password, but they have this funny little eye here, which if you tap, you can see your password. And then you can hide it if you want as well. Progress, in my humble opinion. Um, and the big picture here is right, rather than blindly copying what we've been doing on the desktop and the laptop world, let's literally think through what makes sense for these devices, right? They're different. Different things apply. Other nice things we can do on login forms to sort of deal with some of these issues is that we can use input masks. So if you have to log in with an at me.com email address or an at gmail.com email address, we can just create an input mask for at me.com and then as you type your letters, if you hit an at or something like that, we'll just ignore it and you don't even have to bother with shifting over the keys and doing it here. Twitter uses this on their sign-in screen, the way you sign in with Twitter with is an at handle. So they put the at in an input mask and as you start typing your characters, they take care of that for you. So input masks are another little trick that we can use. So we've got input types, we've got input masks. Another little thing, and I keep saying little things, but together they add up to a big package, which we'll see in a second, right? Small little things that you can do to make this experience better uh, in aggregate actually can make the experience a lot better. So Quora has this thing, if you try to log in with an email address that it doesn't know, it says, hey, no account for this. If you want to create one, sign up right now. So they spare you entering a password and hitting the submit button and then getting an error back and going through that whole flow again. The other thing they do, which is a little bit more aggressive, but also very interesting, which is let me log in without a password on this browser. And that is checked by default. Remember this smart defaults idea that I talked about earlier? So by default, the first time you log in, this is checked. And the second time you come in, you're going to have just a little picture to tap. No username, no password, no button. All you do is tap your picture and you log in. And you can always exit out of this or you can go exit out of this on another browser or what have you. But they've basically taken the login form and turned it into a picture which is pretty neat, right? especially on a personal device like uh, your phone. Um, and the, one of the things that I hear from a lot of people is, oh, okay, well, this makes sense for you know, a social little Q&A app like Quora. But it doesn't make sense for blank. Because I work on insert big hairy thing I think is complex problem here. Right? I work on finance. I work on healthcare. I work on whatever. But here, is a company that's trying to reinvent what your bank is. This is simple. And here where you create the credentials to go and access your bank account, what do we see? There's the show password button. And in fact, they've even gone further because they say, hey, pass, we're going to use a passphrase instead of a password because passphrases are easier to remember and more secure than traditional passwords. Da, 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 da. So here is a financial institution, big, hairy, complex, whatever thing you want to call it actually acknowledging this is a problem and um, working to resolve it. Now if we pull all these things together, remember I said a couple small little things, but together they actually create a pretty interesting way to optimize and adapt something as simple as the login form. So A, we're not going to remove critical features like I can't figure out how to sign in. We're going to use input types and attributes, types equals email, type equals password. We'll show the password by default, we'll let people hide it. We will uh, be flexible in what we accept. So um, you can sign with an email or full name here or email or username if in different situations. We'll uh, save passwords if possible. And when you actually go to log in on a screen like this here on our little uh, Nexus S or whatever this phone is called, Nexus S, right? The Sprint one? What was the Sprint one? The S? All right, if you guys don't know, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> okay. This is an iPhone. <laughs> so we're on our iPhone here. And you enter your 
Email, immediately can tell you, hey, we don't know who you are. You know, save you the problem of entering your password and hitting submit. If you enter a valid one, great. We can sort of show you you're on track. Luke, come on in. You enter your password. We're going to show it to you by default. If there's a mysterious guy behind you, you just hit hide. And you know, depending on your security tolerance, maybe you have it show versus hide as the button. I personally say, you know, here's this giant keyboard, which is much easier to read, especially in the Luminates letters, but whatever. Uh, remember me is, lo is, is checked by default, so the next time you log in, this is what the interface looks like. And notice I've created this exile to be much bigger because, frankly, people have much larger fingers than Quora thinks they do. So we have to design for that when we create these mobile experiences. And here, login is essentially just a single tap, and ta-da, you're in the experience. Right? So we've taken this whole thing of, of uh, logins, usernames, passwords down to a single tap. And these ideas, I've been showing them for mobile devices, but there's absolutely no reason we can't do this on desktops, on laptops, on tablets, and God knows what's coming next. And speaking of God knows what's coming next, we can really think about this authentication experience differently in mobile because we have different capabilities. We're not limited to the sorts of things we can do on the web and on a desktop or laptop computer. For instance, the mobile device is a phone. Phones can send text messages. We often use phone numbers as authentication and as identification, identification, yeah, identification for people. So what you can do is hit the button to sign in and we'll actually send an SMS message in the background, subscribe to SMS notifications and if we have that uh, record in our database and we can confirm you're in possession of the phone, we just let you in. You could do this seven years ago in WAP, now there's competing standards on this, so it's a little mucked up. Another interesting approach to login. This is the uh, Windows Phone, which has very heavily influenced what Microsoft has done with Windows 8 in general. And this is, this is fascinating to me because it's sort of like a mobile-first operating system design, which I don't know if we've necessarily seen. But uh, one of the things these two devices have in common, or these two uh, systems have in common, is they're both touch interfaces. And so the way you log into a Windows 8 machine, they have this feature called Picture Password. And the way picture password works is you upload a photo, maybe of your family, and then you make a couple gestures, like circle or a line or you know, uh, another gesture you can make is a tap. And now you've created a picture password. So this is your computer. Remember, this isn't logging into one website. It's logging into your entire computer. If you want to switch the password, you can. Or if you want to, what you can do is you use your gesture. So what you do is you circle the father-in-law, you connect the two sisters, and you tap the mother-in-law in the nose, and ta-da, you're in. You just logged into your computer. And I keep using this phrase, and I'll use it again with you guys, is I think this is Microsoft taking a very humane approach to login. Because what's more human, right? Like, drawing a picture of my family, punch the mother-in-law in the nose, I'm in! <laughs> or, cannot use Texas child, special characters, front, back, second, third, fourth character, cannot match, sets, two characters, can't be the same. That feels very robot to me. Right? And this feels very human. And again, at this point, people will be like, you know, little dummy, that's like kindergarten security, right? And let's look at that for a second, because I don't like to be called dummy that often, especially when it sounds like that. What movie is that from, by the way? I've like turned that into a thing I say, and I have no idea. It sounds like it's from some movie. Anyway, uh, so you, got a, you have a bank account, four digit, five digit pin. Here's how many permutations you have a four-digit pin for a five-digit pin to get into your bank. So from a brute force attack, here's how many combinations people have to try until they can get to it. If we change that to an alpha character, right, an A to Z character instead of a numerical character, we drastically increase the number of permutations somebody has to go through. Typical complex character password you find on the web, you know, they have enforced a number of character limits, so you can't go below three here. And you can use numbers or alpha characters, which really increases the number of permutations against the brute force attack. Here's how many permutations you get with Microsoft's multi-gesture password. And I think this is a nice example of usability and security are not at odds with each other. It's not like this trade-off you have to make where you can either be secure or you can be usable. Pick. All right? That's all you get, one or the other. I think you can actually do things that create a better experience and increase security at the same time. You just got to sort of work together instead of um, clinging to these old systems. And can you do this on the web browser, since we talk about web things? Sure, you need touch gestures, which you can get through a touch events API that Chrome and uh, Android WebKit and all these other guys have, and now Chrome on the desktop too. 
you got image upload, which is available in uh, iOS 6.0 and above, and Android 3.0 and above, where you can actually grab an image from the camera or from the gallery. And ta-da, you've actually created this user name, this uh, picture password thing in the web browser. And speaking of Android, um, your OS has a similarly interesting thing for login. It's called Face Unlock. And what you basically do is you smile at the phone, and so it discerns that you're friendly. So it uses these dots to make sure you're actually friendly. <laughs> and once it determines that you are, you have now created a facial recognition unlock screen. So if someone else pretends to be friendly to this computer, it can knock it out and say no. Right? But then if you go and look at it, here we go, instantly in. And she'll say, Say it works. <laughs> now, if you doubt the security of this approach, rest assured this man's phone was not able to be foiled by a clever lookalike. <laughs> but again, you know, this is a really interesting way to think about login, right? Just look at the phone. You're in. Where's the username? Where's the password? Where's the alphanumeric pin? Where's the swipey gesture weird thingy that Android devices have? Just look at it, and you're in. Could you do this in the web browser? Well, for that, you need Get User Media API, which is actually in Chrome 25. I think they're putting it into Chrome 18 for Android. And uh, it's in Firefox Nightlies, and it's in Opera. And uh, one other little example. Uh, ATMs in Japan have this really interesting thing where you are the cash card. So instead of bringing around an ATM, you can use biometrics to get into your bank. And there are um, techniques that which you can actually scan fingerprints when you touch a smartphone. Now you can also do things where you detect which finger is down and when. So theoretically, you could have some sort of like, you know, gang sign login, you're doo -doo -doo -doo, and you're in. Again, another way to really rethink login. And that's sort of the theme here, which is, yeah, we can spend all this time optimizing those forms and getting them down to one tap. That's cool. But look at all the potential we have through things like touch through things like instant access to cameras, right? Through things like being able to uh, send SMS messages back and forward. This gives us the opportunity to use mobile as a way to totally change what login is versus spending our time dwindling around with forms. And I think it's worth dwindling around the forms, just to be clear. You know, the alternative is let's copy what we have right now and just make it fit on a small screen. OK, that's one way to approach mobile design. The other way to approach mobile design is let's do a whole bunch of things and sort of challenge our assumptions. Let's show passwords. Let's eliminate usernames and passwords. Make it one tap to log in. Right? Like, let's really push it forward and not just be stuck with the shackles that we created for ourselves before. And you may say, why bother? Well, remember, the mobile device is always with you, always on. You can use it anywhere. So wouldn't you want to make getting into a service as instantaneous and fast as humanly possible? Right? Wouldn't you want to remove all these barriers so somebody can take that high-powered device, connect to the cloud, and do whatever they want instantly? And frankly, if all we're doing is focusing on these sort of layout adjustments, we're going to leave a lot of bigger opportunities behind. And I'm not saying, you know, face unlock or picture password is the future of login, but they don't look anything like a login screen, right? They're totally different experiences that accomplish the same goal, but they've been rethought using the capabilities of mobile. And I think that's sort of the bigger picture story to move these things towards the future. One more example, and I'll shut up. Um, another one of these linchpin critical things on the internet that just gets no love, ever. And you guys have probably seen one of these. It's called a checkout screen. Have you ever bought anything on the internet? Yeah. So I'm only going to show one stat for checkout. In 2011, three-fourths of shopping carts were abandoned. Three-fourths of the time, somebody put something into a shopping cart, they didn't ultimately buy it. Which is disconcerting, but what's more disconcerting is it's getting worse. How is it after 20-something years of designing for the web and making e-commerce things, how are we getting worse? And again, I'm scratching my head here, because you know, a company like Dell, although they're private now, you know, they've taken the time to create this mobile shopping experience, right? In fact, they've taken their checkout form, all of it, and put it onto mobile, including the ability to provide an extension for your mobile number, <laughs> and uh, the ability to provide your daytime fax number, an extension for it. And if you happen to make it through this entire screen, they conveniently tell you that you have the opportunity to not to agree to their terms of sales. That's why you've completed that entire form to not buy something here, right? <laughs> so the first message here is like, let's 
think about ways we can reduce effort. And when I say reduce effort, I don't mean remove critical things. I mean do the due diligence to figure out what's the minimum effort necessary to get something done. There's so many examples of this stuff. Uh, Expedia, in their checkout flow, they had an optional form field titled company. They removed it because they saw in usability testing people were confused. They got 12 million bucks a year overnight. They found 50 to 60 of these kinds of things. Right? If you're the guy who gave them 12 million more of profit a year overnight because you removed an optional field, they're naming a dish in the cafeteria after you. Right? It's like Bob's conversion meatloaf is now on the menu. <laughs> So we can remove unnecessary questions. But we can also do other kinds of things. Again, sort of rethinking and not bringing over what we know from the desktop. What is wrong with this on a mobile device? What is wrong with 16 input fields to collect a phone number on a phone? You could just do that. It's a phone. It's meant for entering phone numbers. And you may say, oh, no, no, but we need all these options. No, you don't. You just need to be able to call somebody if there's something wrong with their order. Well, we deal with businesses. Fine. Okay, maybe they can add an extension if they still have one. Who, you know, okay, maybe we'll do that. If you really bend my arm and smash me against the ground, maybe I'll add another add an option thing, right? But that's only like, okay, you really, you hurt me and I'm not going to go willingly. But we just took 16 input fields down to one. Right? And in the things where we have options, we make them options. We don't expose these things by default to people, so they don't have to consider it. The other thing we did, remember, it's a phone. So you can say, I'm collecting a phone number, and look what pops up. It's a dial pad with these big, fat numbers for entering phone numbers. And guess what? The same thing works on Android, which apparently none of you know, but <laughs> there it is. The same thing works on the Kindle which is running this really weird web browser called Amazon Silk, which I don't know why they made, but here it is. Right? Input type tell. If you want to really be nice to people, let's go set up an input mask where we show them the formatting and as they start typing it in, we're just going to keep that formatting and all we'll do is accept numbers here. If they enter any other format, character, or anything, we'll just ignore it through our input mask and away we go. So that's one way to be really nice to people. Right? We can sort of condense these inputs and bring <laughs> things down. Um, other things that we can do, well, we, what about the address? Could we remove optional fields like this four-digit extension? Eh, not necessarily in the US because some people require the 9 plus 4 zip code. But we can make this thing flexible and sort of combine those two. But here's another issue. Select the state. This drop-down thing. What happens when you tap that? This is the only reason it's awesome to live in Alabama. If you live in Alabama, like every state drop down for you is like one tap. You're like, I'm living the dream, right? <laughs> Say Alabama. Every, every other reason, probably not so good. But for everybody else, it's like tap, scroll, 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 scroll. Whether it's an iPhone thing or an Android little dialogue, scroll, 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 scroll. Tap the one you want, tap and you're done. It's a multi-tap operation. So what we could do instead is maybe, you know, turn that into a text field. Where now if a text field, you're going to enter two characters and again, but still a four tap operation. Now we've inserted some potential for errors because maybe people mistype it and then you know, we, have, we have issues. The, the drop down sort of constrains you and prevents you from making errors, although it makes you swipe around forever. So what about a technique like this where we can say, OK, enter your street address, billing apartment number, and then enter a zip through which we'll get city and state. And if you enter city and state, again, remember, we're using our big numerical dial pad here. So we'll enter city and state, and now we get San Jose. Because there's actually two options that come with the zip code. But we don't want to use this drop down thing again because that's sort of a pain in the butt. So instead, what we'll use is a stepper. Since there could only be up to three of these things, you just use the stepper and you go bop, bop, bop. It's a little bit of a friendlier touch control. So all kinds of things that we can start doing to make address more manageable. And when people see this, they say, well, Luke, what if we could do, ready for magic PowerPoint transition? Whoop. What if we do that? This actually makes me really nervous because I think people are just going to start entering their entire address in here and flail. And they won't ever get to this. Right? So maybe that's not necessarily the way we want to go with um, addresses. Next thing, got to pay for it, right? Credit cards. So how does uh, Dell do this? So on Dell, you select a credit card, you let go, you enter all this information, you make your way through. And I think we can get away with doing something a little bit more like this. So what we're going to do is collect a credit card, your entire payment information here, and we'll set this to type of number because we want to collect the credit card number. But what happens when we set it to input type number? Well, we get all these little, I don't want that. 
Look at that. It was like ripe for touch errors. What I want is this thing that I did when I hit telephone. I want these big fat number keys, right? But this isn't a telephone number, so now like semantics are fighting with usability. So what you can do instead is set an input type pattern where you'll get this big numeric dial pad. So now you've got this pattern up. And what we're going to do is as you start entering a credit card, we'll tell you the type of credit card you have because we can discern that from the pattern. If it's an invalid credit card number, we'll throw an error. If it's valid, what we'll do is just slide it over, slide it over. And now we're going to collect month, month, year, year because it's still numbers. And we have this big numerical dial pad. So now we enter that. And based on the type of credit card you have, we show you where that CVV code is. And again, you're still on the numbers, so you enter your CVV code using that numerical dial pad, and we've just captured all the information you need to collect a payment in one input field. Right? So you've never come off the keypad. You're not jumping between a bunch of input fields. It's all numerical, so we've used these input masks to reduce the potential for errors, because all we'll ever accept is numbers. And uh, you're off to the races collecting payment info. And if you combine all these things together, this is sort of the Uber message I want to get across to you guys. Let's look at what a checkout form could be. If you're dealing with digital content, like a book, a movie, uh, music, whatever, everything, a game, everything is digital these days, right? If you're dealing with digital content, like a little book here, we need to be able to send it to you. So here's your receipt, and here's where you can download it. We can use our payment mask pattern. We can collect your credit card name in one field, and then we just have a button to buy it, and that is our three-field checkout form. For comparison, Dell's checkout form had 42 input fields. 42 input fields compared to three. And you say, again, why bother doing all this work? Well, if you've got your phone with you, it's always on, available at the point of inspiration. Somebody tells you about a book, you can just buy it. And if you doubt the impact of lowering these barriers to entry, I point you to Amazon Prime, which is one-click purchasing, uh, two-day shipping. People that use Amazon Prime go from spending $400 a year on Amazon to spending $900 a year on Amazon. They're responsible for like 20% of US sales because it's so damn easy. Right? You're like, oh, book, book, oh, toothpaste, 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 right? <laughs> They make it so darn easy that you just go buy, buy, buy. And this is sort of the model. The more you can reduce these barriers to entry, the better off you are. So if we can take a 42 field checkout form down to three, right? This is a really, really, really big deal. And again, I've been talking about doing this on mobile, but there's no reason you can't do this on desktops, laptops, tablets, and God knows what's coming next. And speaking of God knows what's coming next, let's look at a couple ways to sort of look towards the future of a checkout experience. Again, using the same kinds of case capabilities we talked about before. Right? So these mobile devices know where they're at. They have cameras on them. They can process images. They can do all kinds of things. So inside of the Apple Store app in the Apple App Store, there's a feature called Personal Pickup. And the way that works is you shop around. You find something you want to buy. You say you want to pick it up in a store. You tell them the store you want to pick it up in. Uh, and that's not the interesting part, the fact that they can find stores near you. The interesting part is when you walk inside that store, somebody comes up to you and says, Luke, here's your iPad. And how do they do that? Well, they do that because they have a Wi-Fi perimeter, and you know they know you bought the thing on your phone. You have your phone with you, because who doesn't walk around with their phone? And as soon as you walk in, it connects to the Apple network, and their little iPad or iPhone comes up and says, hey, here's the guy that bought the iPad. Go give it to him. All right? That is a very interesting checkout experience to me, using mobile and sort of rethinking what mobile can do. Uh, another example here in Korea, this is uh, Tesco. They're a grocery store chain. They're number two. They want to be number one, but they don't want to big giant buildings all over the place. Right? So what they did is they go to places where people spend a lot of time, and they put these illuminated placards that look like grocery store shelves. And what you do is you can go, you know, like milk, 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 egg, egg, cheese. You scan the QR codes, you hit buy, you go on the train, you come home, two hours later, a truck shows up with your groceries. In a city where most people don't have cars, where carrying bags of smelly fish on the subway might not be so great, right? This is awesome. And uh, can we do this on the web? Sure, we can do this on the web through Get User Media. Uh, Card.io is sort of the inverse of this, which is instead of spending money using your mobile device, you can collect money just by taking a video of a credit card. It'll process all that info, input the expiration date, the number for you, and through this they get actually 2x faster registration and conversion. Right. 
And last but not least, and I'll sort of wrap this up, one more example back at Apple. The same Apple Store app in the Apple App Store, which is a tongue twister by the way, has this feature called uh, Easy Pay. And what Easy Pay is, if you're in a store, you can scan any barcode on something that doesn't have a serial number, so a non-Apple serial number product. Uh, it doesn't matter how much it costs. It can cost like 900 bucks. It doesn't matter. You scan it. It tells you what you're looking at. You say pay. You enter your password. You sign in and you just bought it. You walk out. All right. That's all you do. Point the camera at the thing you want. Enter your password and walk out. And uh, if you don't think people will use barcodes to scan things, they actually do do it a lot. So let's Let's compare this stuff for a second to sort of round this out. And let's go, let's stick with the checkout example. So let's say I want to buy a mouse. I would like to buy a mouse from a computer manufacturer. A computer manufacturer that could sell me a mouse is Dell. And they have created a mobile commerce experience, right? This is the Dell mobile commerce experience. I'm buying this mouse, OK? Da, 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 da. Mm, mm. Continue. Ba, ba, da, ba, ba. Go. Continue. Almost finished. Dare you. Ta-da. You just bought a mouse on your phone, right? Like the future of technology is here. Contrast that to the Apple example. Point your phone at a barcode, enter your password, walk out. Now granted, the Apple example is inside the store, so they don't have to collect shipping info. Right? But that's kind of the point here, which is this is a mobile first take on checkout. People have their phone with them as, oh, they'll have their phone in the store. Oh, the phone has a camera. Oh, it's got one click shopping. What can we do to rethink what the checkout experience is? Right? Very much a mobile first sort of checkout thinking mindset. This is a desktop first checkout mindset. Right? What did they do? They took their desktop form and they fit it onto the small screen. And all the issues that you had on the big screen are now magnified like Jacob's nose on, that's how you remember this, right? Just picture that nose, are now magnified on the small screen, right? So mobile first checkout, desktop first checkout. And I leave you to think about, you know, wh what does the future look like? Which direction should we be going? So to summarize this, I think mobile is a massive new medium. I don't think it's a smaller screen. And I think just treating it that way really leaves a lot of opportunities on the table. We've looked at login screens and checkout screens, but you could go through the same process for anything. Right? I deliberately picked these boring, lame sort of things that everybody's familiar with just to show you how like, there's opportunity in every little thing that's out there, um, regardless of how much we think it's already been solved. And if you start treating it as a unique thing, if you start treating it as its own thing instead of the smaller screen that fits stuff on, I think that gives you this opportunity to really adapt and optimize stuff that frankly is a problem now. And those optimizations, those adaptations you do, while mobile forces you to figure that out, it's actually good for all devices, right? Is a faster checkout experience good for a laptop user? Sure. Is an instant login experience good for a desktop user? Sure. Right? I don't think this is you know, restricted to mobile. But mobile sort of has these constraints and these opportunities that force you to rethink things, which is great. And when you do that, right, I think there are opportunities to really think differently about this stuff, right? to look towards what the future of checkout or login or whatever it is we're, we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, even on the web. And I tried to show some examples of um, native applications and how you can actually do that stuff inside of websites as well, because I don't think we want to leave the web behind, right? And as we look at the future, oops, and as we look at the future, I think the future is going to be even more complicated than it is right now, right? We have, we've got to deal with these mobile devices, these tablets, all kinds of things. What about the Apple slap bracelet that's coming out soon? What about the Google Glass? I noticed somebody's looks a little different than mine. Um, this is the model they sent me. I don't know if I'm like in the Alpha Explorer program instead of the early Explorer program. But um, yeah, thank you.